of this episode of Wellesley One-on-One. Dr. Phyllis Gimbel Schnittman is an associate professor in the Educational Leadership and Secondary Education Department at Bridgewater State University. Dr. Gimbel Schnittman has enjoyed a lengthy career in public education as a teacher and principal. She is also the former president of the World of Wellesley, a nonprofit volunteer group devoted to making Wellesley a welcoming community for all. Rama Ramaswamy grew up in Asia and Europe. For years, she worked as a geologist researching extreme environments for the United States Geological Survey. Recently, she published a book of original poetry. A mother of three, Rama also volunteers in the Wellesley Public School System. Phyllis and Rama are meeting for the first time. This is Wellesley One-on-One. I'm Rama. Hi, Rama. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. You work with uh, World of Wellesley. Right. I've been the president of World of Wellesley, and then I was chair of the board. And I kind of got involved in it because my original background is foreign languages. I was a Spanish and French teacher, and I've lived in Spain and France and England and traveled quite a bit. And I've always enjoyed meeting people from other cultures because I like multiple perspectives. Otherwise, I feel like I'm kind of having a narrow life. And I think that's maybe why we got together, because I read about you, and it sounds like you've had a very similar past. Yes. I, I've been everywhere. I grew up um, um, all over Asia and um, parts of Europe, and then I mainly came here for college. Um, and my husband, um, when I met him, he's based out of Boston, so I decided to move up here for him. Um, and I was um, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. I worked for the U.S. Geological Survey uh, for a while. So it's, it's interesting. I, I'm, I've lived in Wellesley now for um, at least a little bit over a decade. And, and I find it interesting. It's uh, for, for a town that's about 15 minutes outside of Boston, it's, it's quite di diverse and it has a lot of interesting things going on. Do you um, take advantage of any of the um, things that go on around town, like the um, art exhibits? I think Wellesley College has a revolving uh, art show that they put on um, annually and other stuff. I go to a lot of events because World of Wellesley co-sponsors. We do a lot of events at the Wellesley Free Library with things from other cultures, and we try to integrate. You talked about Wellesley College. We work with Wellesley College, Mass Bay Community College, uh, and Babson College quite a bit. World of Wellesley sounds like a lot of fun. It's I, a lot of fun. I first heard of it um, because my um, uh, fifth grader, um, they, they write essays um, and poems for World of Wellesley. They have that annual um, competition or something, right, for all Correct. the public schools in, in town. Fun. And it's a lot of fun. The, the kids really enjoy doing that. I was going to ask you, are you surprised by what the kids come up with in, in the fifth grade? That's a good question. I have to be honest and tell you that when one of my children was in the public schools, huh. there was a science fair. And I remember in grade six, a lot of the parents helped their children quite a bit with those science fair projects. And I often wondered how much the child did and how much the parent did. And it kind of troubled me, but it was a worthwhile event because it did bring parents and students together. That's true. So, going back to your question, I sometimes wonder how much parent influence goes into these essays. I don't do, know. Do some of them sound know. like a lot more sophisticated than a, a fifth grader would write? Yes. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Right. It's still a good thing. That's true, right? It's a very yeah. good thing. And, and they're, they are discussing it in class. So they all they all sit around and talk about it and they give each other examples of exactly. things that happened or things that bothered them or things that they like. Because I think it stirs the imagination. And even out on, on the recess you know, playground time, they're, they're talking about it, so. I agree. That's a good thing. I agree it's a with good you. Thing all around. I'm kind of interested in your un I call it a unique background because yeah. you, I like the sound of you combine poetry <laughs> with science. I try to. My question to you yeah. is how how did you um, mesh those? How? Um, it's it's interesting. Um, a, a lot of it is um, sort of just thinking outside the box, um, and there are a lot of um, applications in science or in literature that you know, the other side doesn't understand. So it's it's really it's um, interesting for me to figure out a better means of communication to, to gel the two. Like a lot of scientists um, are very cut and dry and they don't, um, they don't try to explain the big words that they use. 
and, and people in literature are, um, are often perceived uh, by scientists as not making any sense and having no sense of logic and they're sort of you know, fluttering all over the place um, without any you know, cogent explanation of what they're doing. So um, it's interesting, it's a process. Um, but, but I find it enjoyable because I think, I think that both um, realms have a lot to offer each other. And I think it's important to judge your audience, so the people, your target audience of who you're trying to reach and what you're trying to communicate. And then you need to sort of bend how, how you say things and how you explain um, both, both areas, either science or literature, to that target audience. So I do a lot of um, teaching at the public school level. Um, and I try to, I try to um, have the students really enjoy and appreciate different aspects of scientific inquiry and um, creating a hypothesis and um, doing field investigations. Um, and I also am um, involved in the uh, fourth grade geology unit that they have. So for me, it's, it's always a process. Every time I take out a group of students or I, I try to teach them something about science, I, I try to figure out, um, I try to understand, am I really reaching them? Are they getting inspired by what I'm saying? And what words should I be using in order to better explain myself? So it sort of goes. It sort of goes from there. I don't know if that really answers the question. So but basically, you don't attribute the skills that you have to a particular teaching method of any kind, or a school, or right. something formal, but more uh, the ability or the desire to be able to communicate well right. to the target audience. Right. right. And That's I, interesting. And I'll sit down and I'll think about how I said it and what I said, and then I'll, I'll go over. Um, my notes and I'll try to tweak it for the next time. Well this is really interesting and the fact that you're doing it in the public schools because I'm sure you know because of your own three children that now we have in America something called the Common Core State Standards. I'm sure you've heard about it. They're called CCSS and there's a huge focus on what they call informational reading and writing, argumentative writing, persuasive writing and that's exactly what you're talking about because the focus used to be more uh, reading a lot of fiction and now they're saying they want students to be able to read non-fiction informational texts because of the way the world is going and to be able to write pieces all the way through elementary and high school that can persuade an argument and form just what you're talking about a right. hypothesis. And, and that's very important I think for essay writing skills to develop essay writing skills because that's really what an essay is. Right, so it's, it's the ability to formulate an argument and then um, speak for or against your hypothesis. And a lot of that is like scientific writing. And that's a sort of a, it's based in logic. Right. And so that's a very important skill that, that people need to have. And that's really what um, I try to, to communicate when I'm teaching kids. Um, and it's different. Um, usually I have um, classes with um, kids of, of different groups, like different age groups. So it, it's different how you would approach a kindergartner or a first grader from a fifth grader. So you need to be able to, um, to translate and you know, speak to uh, whichever group you're speaking to and then get your information across to them in a way that they can retain and understand and maybe even get inspired by. So uh, Now you made me uh, curious. What if the students with whom you're working are not motivated or inspired? What do yeah, you do? There's, there's always a subset of, of those people. But, but you know, um, after, after a while, you know who those, those kids are. So I usually move them up front. <laughs> and then I look at them when I talk to them, and I ask them questions. And so even if they're not, um, um, they had a bad night, or you know they didn't, they missed breakfast, or you know they had a fight with a friend, um, I try to draw them into the conversation so that for that 15 minutes or that 25 minutes that I have them, uh, they will at least think about something that's that's being said or what the other kids are saying. They'll take something away from it. So the stuff you do with the Wellesley Public Schools, is that on a volunteer basis? It, it is. How do they know when to invite you in? Right, so I, I'm in contact with uh, most of the teachers at the school. At all different schools? At, um, no, mostly at, at Hardy, um, where my kids go. Who's the principal but, at Hardy? I can't um, remember. Well, this year we have an interim um, principal. Oh, right. We have uh, Bernie Small, and we're, we're doing a, a search. I think they found someone. Oh, good. Um, and I don't know who that is yet, but... Um, so, uh, but, but I, you know, I, sometimes I do take it to other schools depending on uh, what they need and like for example the geology unit and I work with um, the coordinator, the science coordinator for all the public schools um, for developing and tweaking those programs. So, do you it's, think it's, it's, it's important it's for parents to be involved? Oh, I think it's essential. I think it's essential. It's not only that, you know, that your children see that as a parent you're interested in their education, and they see you during school hours um, taking the class out or being there. And, and that's always rewarding. Um, maybe not, again, directly, 
um, but, but they do enjoy it. And, and, they, and they like to see that their parents are interested in things that they're learning and doing. And they spend time with you um, during school time and you meet all their friends and you get into that community. So it sort of works both ways. You know, they raise you and, and, and you hang out with them. So here's where I feel a little bit, I'm going to use the word sad, as a member of the world of Wellesley yeah. and thinking about fairness and social justice and equity and access for all. The students who come from Boston, right. it's difficult for their parents to do the kinds of things that you're talking about. And that's where I feel sad. I used to teach in a public school in the town of Lincoln, right. Massachusetts, right. about 25 minutes from here, right. and they have a large uh, population of students from Boston. Uh, and I used to feel sad because those kids would get up like at five in the morning right. and ride a bus for right. an hour. hour right. By the to time they here. got here, the other students in the local community were just waking up right. and they'd already been up over two hours. Right. And then they had another hour's yeah. ride. And then another thing that made me sad is the local parents would pick up their children from time to time and take them to after school enrichment activities. Right. And the other kids had to go back on the bus right. and even babysit some of them for younger children while their parents worked. Right. And I'm just wondering, have you met, have your children met any of the Boston children? They, or? they have, and they're actually good friends with some of the Boston kids. And I, I had um, uh, one of them um, ask me one day, uh, one of them was feeling kind of bad that, that um, his, his mother um, doesn't come on the, on the uh, field trips that we run. So I ended up telling him that, well, there's a lot of um, kids here who live here in Wellesley whose parents don't come. And it's, oh, it's really just, you know, one or two parents, you know, who, who, who can do it and they, they come and they do it and we're very grateful, you know, for taking time out of their day. And so it's not, you know, it's really not everybody, but, but while we're on this field trip, we're going to have a lot of fun. And that's the nice thing I like about this town is that, you know, there, I've met a lot of people who are very conscientious about, about things like that and about volunteering their time and uh, making an effort to, um, to enrich all the different things, the good things about the town that we have. Do you go back to India ever? Um, to I try to. I try to. Still have a lot of family there, so we, we do try to try to make it back. Well, what I like, this is kind of silly, is I've been taking yoga for like 15 or 20 years, and that is of Indian origin. It right? is. It is. And it's just so. That's. I find yoga peaceful yeah. and hopeful. Yeah. So, uh, I'll tell you a funny story about yoga. So my colleague at the Geological Survey was um, uh, speeding. She got pulled over. Um, and, the, and the police in America? In, yes, in Virginia. And, and so the policeman said, "Where are you going in such a daring hurry at eight o'clock in the morning?" And she said, "I'm trying to get to yoga. I'm late." <laughs> that is funny. So, so he he let her off without a ticket because he just started laughing, laughing. He's like, "Oh, oh you need it. You know, I you can, better get to your yoga I can match, class." I can match that story. Okay. As I said, yoga I find peaceful and hopeful, and that's one of the reasons I like to do it, yeah. especially because I feel so relaxed afterwards. It's a great stretching exercise. It's wonderful. Well, exactly a year and three quarters ago, a year and three months, excuse me, I was in Vermont on a Friday evening and I knew they were having a wonderful yoga class from quarter of five to quarter of six and it was in January. When I went into the class, it was snowing. When I came out of the class, it was a major blizzard. Now, I was totally relaxed when I came out of the class. <laughs> But my usual ride home is 21 minutes. Right. It took me an hour and 17 minutes to come home, and I was a stress case. Here I had gone to relax, and the driving was so bad that I was worse off. Turn around and go back. Just turn around and go back to the yoga class. I just spent the night there. <laughs> I was angry with myself for even trying to go to the right. class. Right. Well, obviously, when you're always stuck in traffic for like two hours driving.